talk derives from both my past research, I focus on Mexico and Turkey specifically, uh, a critique of bank privatization, but as much as the word here uh, you know, it signals, there's a need to move beyond critique and to think about what it is in terms of alternatives. So this, this presentation derives both from my work in the past, but my, my new field work, looking at state bank, specifically in Turkey, but I'm branching out more. Uh, and a distinctive aspect of this work, I think, is that I spend, this is in early 2013, I spend a lot of time talking to bank workers, and to farmers, and to people working in collectives in Turkey, uh, not only in the big cities, but throughout the country, in a couple of different regions, to get a sense of what it is they see in the large state of banks. And I'll explain a little bit more about the Turkish state of banks shortly. Uh, so this, this talk is a little bit of a mix of general discussion of state of banks, but also deriving more specifically from Turkey's experiences, and then we can have a little, a little bit of a discussion around that. Um, I understand we have a short presentation, which I appreciate, less me talking and hopefully some more interaction. But I want to sort of set the way I look at this question of banks to you, because I don't look at it from an economist perspective. I have a very sort of social science background, uh, labor background, actually, bringing to this question of banks. And to, for me, that means understanding where we're at. And I define, in the context of countries like South Africa, Turkey, Mexico, Brazil, the BRICS, we're in a place called emerging finance where I define it as the current phase of accumulation, where the interests of financial capital are fused into the state apparatus as institutionalized priorities and overarching social logic, guiding the actions of state managers and government and elites, but specifically this is coming into detrimental labor. Uh, that the way in which financial financialization exists today rests predominantly and specifically on exploiting labor. There's no other way neoliberalism prevails or financialization Persist. This leads me sort of the thesis of my talk, the, the main point of my research and where I'm redirecting my work toward is that this question of state owned banks, and not only necessarily state owned, but public owned, there's various forms of this worker control, uh, community controlled banks uh, that you can look at. But I see this as probably as a necessary moving beyond private banking, private finance, a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition to break with. Neoliberalism or emerging finance capitalism. I say not sufficient because if you start looking at state owned banks, you can quite easily recognize that many state owned banks in the world today can be aggressively neoliberal, and management of state owned banks can be harsher on bank works than private banks have ever been. Uh, so there's a need to sort of push for different form of ownership, but more specifically towards the question of democratized ownership and control. And we have to learn what exists in terms of where it exists. So a lot of my work then, my understanding of state-owned banks and their complexity uh, derives from a lot of my work specifically on, on Turkey, but I've done a lot of work in Mexico as well. Uh, there's not really you know, any state-owned banks left in this sense. But I begin with the premise of understanding banks as institutionalized relationships of social power and class. That they're not, the banks are not fixed entities, that they shift in time, and that the, the what matters in understanding state banks or public banks is their social content. Who drives them? What are the political priorities behind them? What kind of social forces are, are determining the mandates of the state banks? And I want to give you a little bit of a profile of, of Turkey's state banks to give you a sense of the significance of this. So in Turkey today, uh, there are three very large commercial state banks nationwide. Uh, employing you know, tens of thousands of workers, uh, controlling about 30% of the, the uh, banking sector, alongside two smaller developments. So something very different in South Africa, where all the commercial banks are basically privately owned with two quite small state-owned development banks. Uh, they're very, very profitable banks. The largest bank, Zidat Bank, which was the picture I showed, takes in over between 1.5 to $2 billion a year in profit. It is the 10th most profitable bank in Europe, uh, and it's one of the largest banks in Europe as well. And then there's two other smaller, slightly smaller banks, Hulk Bank, which, which derives into the People's Bank, or translating to that, and another Zira, or, um, Bank, which is a foundations bank, which is 
specifically around supporting cultural foundations, heritage sites, these sorts of things. The Zeta Bank is an agricultural bank. And it's a bank that's been in existence in Turkey since 1863. And it's basically been profitable, more or less, uh, and stable for you know, well over 100 years, 150 years. However, just because it's stable doesn't define its necessary operations. Uh, while for decades, the Zeta Bank and the other banks, stable banks, have actively and sustainably and in very interesting way supported development and supported uh, very large cooperatives, for example, small farmers, peasant farmers in Turkey. Uh, they have been restructured as many stable enterprises in the last 10 years so that they act very much as if they're private profit seeking banks. So it's very difficult in some ways to understand the difference simply by looking at these banks if they're any different from HSBC or Citibank and that sort of thing. Particularly in Turkey, but as a general condition, uh, worker unionization is available in the state banks, but very low density. It's about four or five different unions, uh, largely corporatist. It is illegal to strike as a bank worker in Turkey, as it is in Mexico, as it is in a number of countries. You can unionize, but you can't strike. Uh, and they recently, we, uh, among myself, uh, launched an anti-privatization campaign back in uh, a few months, a number of months ago, four or five months ago, but it's very weak, uh, partly overtaken by political events in Turkey right now, which are sort of blowing up. Uh, the banks exist within a government context of the last 10 years, of, 10 years or so now of the uh, Justice and Development Party, AKP which is the most aggressive privatizing government that Turkey has seen in its history. They privatized more in the last five to ten years uh, than all previous governments since the 1980s. And they're aggressively doing so still. However, the, even the, if the government is uh, actively pro-privatization, nonetheless they see some benefit in having these state-owned banks insofar as Amidst the 2008-2009 crisis, it was widely recognized within Turkey and outside of Turkey that the state owned banks played a major role in mitigating the impact of the global crisis on Turkey and played a very important, several important uh, functions, I guess, in stabilizing the economy. But nonetheless, this was done in a way that was reproducing neoliberalism. There was no substantive change in, in sort of what I believe to be the final feature of neoliberalism, which is the repression of rights, the pushing of the cost of prices onto workers. That remains there. The state of has played a role in mitigating that. And most recently, since December 2015, they've been involved in, in major corruption scandals in Turkey in terms of uh, you know, the, the second largest state owned bank, the general manager, they found four and a half million dollars in shoeboxes in his house. Uh, the other large zero bank, the agricultural bank, they identified that they lent $200 million loan to a large corporation, which was a loan to pay corruption charge to the president, to the prime minister, sorry, Erdogan. So there, there are obviously problems in terms of how the banks are run, the, the very liberal word of governance, but that there's no effective popular control or accountability within the banks. And this is a huge problem for us to get to address in terms of a left socialist uh, approach to banking. I want to emphasize, though, that there are important potential advantages to state-owned banks or public banks that we have to think about it and underpin what the real sort of, what pushing away from private banks can offer unionists, NGOs, social forces, uh, poor people, in a sense. And there are some important advantages that, that state ownership does begin to confirm, but not necessarily. That they can, at times of crisis, engage in counter cyclical lending. This is why people are looking at stable banks in Turkey now and saying, wow, we did a good job. When all the other private banks were cutting back lending, the stable banks up their lending at times of crisis. They can do this very effectively. They provide stable, long term support and can reduce the cost of work. So you can offer subsidized loans to farmers, you can offer subsidized loans to universities. <coughs> That's not women, is it? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Five minutes, okay. That through extra market coordination, you can privilege 
different areas of the economy that the private sector simply will not touch. And you can do this explicitly and at a reduced cost. State-owned banks can also be a very effective form of income distribution or redistribution and social inclusion. I'll touch on this a little bit later. But there are models of state-owned banks that effectively do what this whole microfinance micro revolution does, and they've done it for decades. State-owned banks can exist in parts of a country, in small towns, and service people who you know, need small loans, who like small loans. Uh, or other industries without the highly exploitative conditions that we see in microfinance. They can do it at cheap rates of interest and they can do it in a way that builds popular solidarity and a sense of public This This was a, one of the strongest things that came through my interviews in Turkey is that the bank workers who worked in the state of banks had a sense that they did have a public duty, that they were performing a, 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 a social good service through banking that was not available elsewhere, but that through the restructuring of the state-owned banks from the top down, that this has been eroding over the last 10 to 15 years. State-owned banks can be a huge source of public revenue, which can then be redistributed or cross-subsidized into other areas of the economy quite easily. Uh, as I mentioned, viable, less exploited form of finance and then microfinance. But you can easily privilege green or gendered strategies for development in them explicitly. And, and you see different examples of this happening in state owned banks, which simply do not happen in private banks. Uh, there's an example of the Hulk Bank in Turkey funding the, the greening of a large uh, university in the north of Turkey through uh, funding the placement of windows and solar panels and things like this, and basically greening a university campus. And then there's, there's the obvious and important one, but the one that the neoliberals hate to talk about the most by subordinating ownership to public ownership or some form of state ownership, that opens up possibilities of democratization of finance. And then this, uh, I don't know if the gentleman was here, but one of the points that came up yesterday in terms of countering sort of this question of imperial forces and the, the obvious power of global finance is that only by building some sort of domestic capacity to manage money are you able to push back in terms of power foreign banks, of massive national private banks, the IMF, World Bank, these sorts of things. So in this, in this case, the BRICS Bank is a potentially interesting multilateral bank whose future is yet to be determined in terms of what it will do. Uh, and so obviously, for state-owned banks, you can simply eliminate the profit share. The Turkish state-owned banks, up until the crisis of 2001, never had a profit mandate. They were never mandated to make money. You can exist for decades and decades and decades and never turn a profit, and that's not a problem. Uh, the the state-owned banks can obviously work. Uh, there are obviously challenges with this. As I mentioned, uh, if we're going to break with neoliberalism, if we're going to look forward to sustainable public services, healthcare, electricity, uh, other forms of supporting workers, then we have to break with the power of finance. And you can only do that by addressing. It also means addressing the political orientation to the privileges that governments have, that can have, and manifest themselves through state banks. So yes, there are problems of corruption. So how do we deal with that? How do we think about that in terms of alternative forms of control and ownership? And these exist. Uh, there's a worker control popular bank in Costa Rica that has an explicit workers council that directs the operations of that, of that bank. Uh, and other forms of governance, but they're as yet uh, unexplored, if you will. Entrenched ideology of World Bank, it's a, as I like to call it, self-hating state-owned bank. World Bank is a state-owned bank, it's the most aggressive uh, anti-state-owned bank institute out there. And there's a problem of within the bank organizations that there's a lack of general organization. Unionization tends to be weak. This varies. India has incredibly powerful a million people will walk out and shut down the banking sector regularly. So it's very possible to organize in the banking sector. And, and this should be recognized. But there's also problems with people like me, or in our field in academics, that there's a banking blind spot. Among critical scholars, notably Marxists, we like to critique finance, we have no idea what we want to offer. Uh, NGOs and labor unions. And to some extent, uh, 
this is this is the you know, part of the challenge. What's interesting about the MEC uh, project is this idea that we can begin to explore public alternatives, public banking, not from the perspective of their international role, but from a bottom-up worker, NGO, public sector perspective that can be very viable and powerful. Thank you very much.